praying that I'll be brief either. Thank you, Lord. Bless each one today. Let us hear your spirit speak to us in the name of Jesus. And everybody loves the Lord said amen. amen. All right, I want to day, begin today with a verse that most likely very, very, very few of you have ever heard. I don't know if you, if you have or not. John 14, 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Three weeks ago, I think I must have read this verse 15 times through the sermon. So did you all get it? I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Three weeks ago, January 7th, we taught uh, out of John uh, 14, 15, and 16, and we saw that during those, those three places, Jesus addressed the Holy Spirit as the comforter four different times in three chapters. You think maybe he's trying to make a point. You know, it's kind of interesting that, well, I don't know how many of you like MMA fights or whatever, but I, I love MMA fights. And uh, the very last round is when they really open up and go wild. Because that's when, that's when the best that the, the judges remember, the last round so I want to just hit on some things today. We've been teaching about the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many more weeks we're going to talk about him, but we're, we're going to talk about his character again. And uh, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, he told the disciples the Holy Spirit would be everything that he has told them. He will be an exact duplicate of Jesus himself. And that he, it's imperative that he leaves so the Holy Spirit can come. And he said, uh, I will not leave you as orphans or finos. I will not leave you as a child who feels like they've lost their parents or as a student who feels like he's been abandoned by his teacher. And uh, I've said many times that he, the Holy Spirit, is the comforter. That word there is parakletos. And, and Strong's Concordance defines him and describes him as an intercessor, counselor, advocate, and comforter. And I love last, the last time we shared on this, I shared uh, an expanded definition of this word, parakletos, by Rick Renner. And I love the way he does this. Para, the first half, para, means alongside. This carries the thought of being near or very close to someone or something else. Being very near or very close. It's very, I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit's pretty close when he's living inside you. Pretty near. And the second word is, is kaleo. Uh, to beckon or to call. This kind of calling carries the thought of a sense of strategic power, purpose, specific intent, and concrete direction. So three weeks ago, we taught about the first half, para, para, alongside. So today, I think it'd be right to finish that word with kaleo. And on your handout, number one, the Apostle Paul used the word kaleo when he described his calling in the first verse of Romans 1.1, 1, 1, which says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called, that blank is called, to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Called to be an apostle. So according to the word definition of Calio, God's calling was the giving of strategic, specific directions and purposes. I believe we can also include this as Proverbs 29.18, that without a vision, people perish. The calling the calling, the kaleo, is actually the placing of God's vision into our heart it's when he calls us. The apostle Peter said this, that his first calling was for him to obtain salvation. We've all been called to be born again. Can you say amen? amen? Everyone's been called to be born again. Jesus doesn't want to leave anybody out. He's not willing that any should perish. But our first calling, and Peter said his was, of course, like everyone else, was a call to salvation. And then he received concrete definitions and directions, purposes of ministering the gospel. And he was sent to the Jews to go preach to the Jews. So if you search the Bible and get into the Greek, which a lot of people don't get into the Strong's and they're not interested in it. I love getting into the Greek in the New Testament, the Hebrew in the Old Testament, because it gives you greater understanding of what words mean. A good example, we can say, well, I love that. I love that. Well, there's four or five different Greek words for love. Phileo, agape, eros, so forth. So if you look in the Bible, you start to, to, uh, rightly dividing it, you can find the word kaleo or a derivative, that's the right word, words that came out of that word over 600 times. 
in the New Testament. I thought you'd like to know that. That and a buck and a half would get you a cup of coffee down the road at Casey's. But uh, one of my favorite verses, and any time we read the word, I always think of j Dog because every verse that he reads is always his favorite verse. So my favorite verse at this moment, j Dog, just for you, 1 Peter 2, 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That don't mean weird. Peculiar means hand-picked and chosen by God. A peculiar people who should show forth that you should show forth the praises of him who has called, Calio, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. <laughs> People. <laughs> Let's go on. In Matthew 22, Jesus shared a parable with the religious leaders about a wedding that was uh, everyone was invited to. And if you remember all their lame excuses, Luke 14, 18 says, but they all began making excuses. I'm glad we never make excuses. I'm glad when the Lord tells us to do something that we're always obedient in right on the spot. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, you lying. No, 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 don't do that. They all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. And another said, I now have a wife. So don't even ask me to be there. All these excuses. See, I can give you, you want a good excuse? Watch this. Look over there by the service door of my garage. See that big box there? I'm going to make an excuse and say we're going to cut this really short because I got something in that box that I've been waiting on. I would go to the wedding, Jesus. I'd go to the wedding, but I've got a mag drill over there in a box that I've got to get. See how it works. Alan's coming over. He's just foaming at the mouth. Man, when you get that, you let me know. I want to come check it out. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you, buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were reading in Matthew 22, the last of the verse that amazes me is verse 14 where Jesus says, Many are called, but few are chosen. That almost sounds like predestination. There, there is a fact that we have been predestined. Not, I don't believe in, I don't believe in the, the, the teaching on election where some are chosen and some are not. God's not willing that any should perish. But if you study this out, what you'll conclude is, it's actually saying many are called, but few make the right choice. See, that puts it back on us. That's why there's few. Everyone's called. Few make the right choice. I met with someone uh, last week, had a chance to share with them the gospel Share just laid it all out, made it as simple as I could. And he says, well, I don't know whether I believe that yet. But you know what? The sower sows the seed. That's all we're called to do. We're called to be sowers of the word. Sow the seed. It's not up to you to make sure it gets down in their spirit, man. It's not up to you to sit there today and hope the person next to you is hearing what the pastor's saying. You sow the seed, let God take care. I remember when we bought this property here, I met with the guy that was, for lack of better words, I'll call him a pastor, but he, wasn't, he was not a pastor. The senior pastor, when he retired, told the congregation, do not make that guy senior pastor because he's not called to be a pastor. I met with him. We sat in the conference room one night. We were talking about things. I said, so when were you called into the ministry? He goes, <laughs> He said, I don't believe in callings. He said, I believe if you're a good teacher, you ought to teach. If you're a good singer, you ought to sing. Well, that's why they went from 300 members in their church to nine when we bought the property. Because he was not, he was not called. Did not believe in callings. Many are called. Few make the right choice. Paul sure did, didn't he? I found this really interesting. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about all the other ministry gifts who were called and lists them, of course, in Ephesians 4.11, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. However, in his time, 
Watch this now. In his time, the calling into the ministry of an apostle required the person to have physically seen the Messiah prior to his crucifixion in order to be an authentic witness of his resurrection. Can you catch this? I mean, people are saying today, well, I'm an apostle. Well, an apostle today is a whole lot different than what it was back in this time. So, I want you to look at what he said about the method what Paul said, the method God used when he called him, which is a completely different calling than others. In fact, his calling uh, caused a lot of contention between he and the other apostles. Caused a lot of strife because they didn't agree. 1 Corinthians 15.8 says, And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. My dad, before he passed, used to say all the time, he said, I was just, I was just born at the wrong time. I can't keep up with all this stuff, all these cell phones and all these crazy things, and I just, I was born at the wrong time. This is what Paul said. And last of all, he was seen in me also as of one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles. Well, thank God. He, can you imagine if he'd have been the greatest of the apostles? I mean, he wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Look at all the churches he established in his known world at that time. He said, And I am the least of the apostles, that I am not fit. To be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So the other disciples had seen Jesus. They spent three and a half years with him prior to his crucifixion. But Paul was not a follower of Jesus. We know that. Nor did he know him until the post-resurrection. Y'all still with me here? On the road to Damascus, we know he was confronted by God, which he considered to be a heavenly vision. What it is that? What is it? Calio, calling, a heavenly calling. And after he was knocked off of his horse, he shared what happened to him with King Agrippa. Acts 26, 16. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. This is when God was telling Paul, get on your feet. You are to tell the world what you have seen and what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you both from your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles. He said it this way. I'm going to deliver you from the people so I can send you to the people. Can you catch that? Verse 17, and I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. On your handout, number two, after being confronted by God and inducted into his kingdom, Paul immediately began fulfilling the Kaleo, the strategic, specific, concrete directions and purposes that God had assigned him by witnessing to the Roman ruler Agrippa, who also was guilty of persecuting Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, maybe there was some kind of rapport between them because they were both guilty of the same things. So here's what I saw that was awesome. Because of Paul's reputation, namely the persecuting and killing of Christians, he referred to himself as being the least of all the apostles. I believe his greatest regret was when he encouraged the murder of Stephen. Okay, Acts 8.1, Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. Imagine carrying that around in your, in your knapsack. I'm the one that was guilty. He basically said, I don't deserve God's calio. I don't deserve God's calling in my life because I've done too many things contrary to his will. Newsflash. Doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, what you said. The blood of Jesus, one drop of blood is enough to cleanse this whole world. And the enemy wants to get so many people into a place where I've done this and I've done that and I've failed here and I blew it there and I, all of these things. You know, the enemy is really alive and well. He is more active and productive on his job than most of us. He is the accuser of the brethren. He'll remind you of all the things of your past to try to prevent you from receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, I've gone too far. I've done too much. This is basically what Paul is saying. I don't deserve God's calio in my life because of what I've done. Even though he was a member of the Sanhedrin court, 
very well, very well learned. He'll tell you that in Corinthians. He knew the law inside and out, but his guilty conscience had convicted him and convinced him that he was not qualified for the calling of God. I've always said there's two kinds of pastors, the called and the crazy. Some pastors would be better laying carpet or putting on roofing. I'm, I'm telling you right now, the self-appointed, self-anointed, they're the crazy ones. Most of the time I find out when God calls somebody in the ministry, it's ba basically the last thing that they ever thought they would do. So listen to the message, if you will. 1 Timothy 1.12. Here's Paul. I'm so grateful to Christ Jesus for making me adequate to do his work. Are you catching that right there? Those that he calls, he equips. I'm so grateful to Christ Jesus for making me adequate to do his work. I didn't plan on emphasizing that as much. He has made you adequate to sow his seed. You are more than able. Let's go on. He went out on a limb, you know, entrusting me with this ministry. I think he did that with any of us. We, he went out on a limb with all of us. The only credentials I brought to it were invective, which means insult, and witch hunts and arrogance. But I was treated mercifully because I didn't know what I was doing. Didn't know who I was doing it against. Grace mixed with faith and love poured over me and into me and all because of Jesus. That's powerful. But there's a story what we need to see here. It shows us how loving and merciful and long-suffering God is. Any of you got, had got kids that's raised now? Adult kids? Did you ever wonder if they were ever, ever going to make it? Will they ever? Jerry's back there waving. Jerry better calm down, man. Are they ever going to get it? You ever imagine God looking down saying, Rob, will you ever get it? Think of that. He has called you. He has called you, Calio you with the holy calling but I'm not a pastor I'm not an evangelist I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not in the fivefold ministry he has called you to witness to the world around you maybe people will see your life when you begin to sing when you begin to be joyful. Remember years ago, I used to get gas down here at this one station in town. I, I've shared this before. I went in one time. I'd been gone in several times filling my truck. I had a truck that loved it pass everything but a gas station. And I'd go in there all the time. And one time I walked in, the guy that was running the place, you know, we kind of become friends. I walked in. He goes, you know, it's absolutely not right. It is just not right. I said, what's well, not right? Nobody should be as joyful as what you are all the time. I want to say, well, let me introduce you to my wife. She'll, she'll clarify some things. <laughs> but by now, we, we know how the Holy Spirit works, don't we? Yes. On Friday, I was reading an article. This is interesting. Uh, Karen always prints them out from Rick Warren. I don't care what you think about Rick Warren. Rick Warren, he takes care of his own stuff. But every week, he'll send out a little article, like a one page. Maybe sometimes it's page and a half. So the other day, I picked up a few of them in, in Karen's office. And I took them home. And I had this word all ready to go. And I'm starting to read through. And I found an article that you'll love. Guess what it was about? Being confident in God's directions. Gosh, what a coincidence. Isn't it weird how all these coincidences take place all the time when really we know it's God? It's all about being called and yet many times by feeling inadequate or guilty of things in the past, we fear and we question God's strategic and specific concrete directions and purposes that he assigned us. Here's a real cute story that I found from a very, very popular person with a lot of experience. Charlie Brown is standing on the pitcher's mound. He says, a pop fly, I've got it, it's all mine. If I catch this ball, we'll win the first game of the season. Then he starts praying, please let me catch it. Please let me be the hero, 
please let me catch it. Please, please. Then as the ball comes down, he says, on the other hand, do I think I deserve to be the hero? Is the baseball game really that important? The next frame he says, lots of kids all over the world have never even heard of baseball. The next frame, lots of kids don't get a, play, a place to play ball at all or to have a place to sleep. Finally, the ball falls into Charlie's mitt but then bounces out onto the ground. Linus comes up and says, Charlie Brown, how could you miss such an easy pop fly? Charlie Brown replies, I prayed myself out of it. <laughs> Sila, that means to pause and think about that. How many times do we do the exact same things? He quickens us and we begin to second guess it, and rationalize in our mind, and we totally miss the Calio calling point specific directions from God. I would bet, if you all be honest, you could all stand up and within the last 30 days you can think of an event where you had a chance to say something or do something, but you didn't do it because of the past, because of whatever it might have been. Every one of us. Yeah, that's screaming somebody. So look at your neighbor and tell them, you've been called to save the lost. You've been called to save the lost. What are you going to do with that calling? What will you do with your calling? Handout on your, on your handout number three, Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. He's not saying you'll be a wise guy. He says you'll be wise, the wisdom of God. So be wise and win souls, and that is what you've been called to do. How many of you remember a guy named Mike Warnke? Remember Mike Warnke? He, uh, he used to be a, a Satan worshiper. He was a high priest in, in the Church of Satan. Got delivered, got set free, and I love what he said one time. He said, I have found such a glorious thing in Christ that all I want to do is present him to my friends so they'll know the glory of God. And that's the way it's supposed to be. So again, the Calio conveys the idea of being called to do a specific thing. And as I said, I believe it also refers to vision. Write it down, publish it, expect it, go for it. See, which each of us are number one. Every one of us, every person that you see on this earth is called to salvation. Everyone. Number two, they're called to minister to the lost. That's the primary goal. Number three, they're called to a specific ministry of some sort. And number four, we're, they're called to serve in a particular local church. Can you hear this? I think a lot of times we just willy-nilly think I'm just going to, oh, well, I think I'll go over here, and then I think I'll go over there, and then I think I'll go there. What you need to do is get before the Lord and say, Lord, where do I belong? And God will place you where you can be most fruitful. God wants you to be in the right place. But just because the pastor rubs you the wrong way or somebody doesn't wink at you or somebody didn't come over and hug you in the pew because you refused to get out and be sociable. Now, I'm not picking on anybody. I don't know who you are and who did that. But we've been called to salvation. We've been called to preach the gospel. We've been called to some kind of a ministry, whatever it may be, not necessarily five-fold ministry. And we're called to serve in a local church where God puts us. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God hath set. What's that mean? That comes from calling. God has called some in the church, apostles, prophets, thirdly teachers, so forth, miracles, gift healings, governments, diversities. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. What is the best gift? The best gift is the one that's needed at that time. At that time. When I read this, I feel like the Holy Spirit showed me that your specific calling is every bit as vital as someone called into the fivefold ministry. I know there was a church down south that used to preach that every single person is called into the fivefold ministry. I do not believe that. But your calling and your specific calling is just as vital as the pastor and the evangelist and all the rest of them. Do you realize what this church would be like if 
You depended on me to cook all your potluck dinners? <laughs> or, or some of the other stuff that, that y'all, y'all end up doing that, because I'm, I'm not called to do that. I guarantee you don't want me cooking for you. <laughs> but every part, every joint supplies. And you may say, well, I don't feel like I'm important. I'm going to tell you what, if you do one thing, if, if you stand at the door and say hi to the people coming in, that is a ministry. You're, you're, you're vital, vitally important. Number four. The word kalio shows us that the Holy Spirit also was called for a specific work and given a clear purpose and direction. You know, when, when Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel, that, that is, that's your, your sphere or your realm of influence. I mean, like, like Brother Chuck. I, Brother Chuck, I don't know what you do throughout the week. I think you do electrical work. I'm, I'm, but you have a certain influence on a specific group of people that there's prob- probably I'll never even talk to. So you go into all your world. j Dog, you go into all your world. Rob, you go into all your world and share the gospel. And this is, this is God's plan. Okay? So, the Holy Spirit, as you just filled in, your, your outline, the Holy Spirit was called. He received a calio. So specifically, what are some of the callings that the Holy Spirit has received? Number five, the Holy Spirit has been called by Father God to be our helper, intercessor, counselor, advocate, and comforter. That's just a few. We're going to cover a whole lot more in the future. So again, I want to look at three specific things we've learned about the Holy Spirit. Number six, the Holy Spirit has been called to remain close alongside of us. Think about where you're taking him, where near you go somewhere. Think about that. Ponder the path of your feet. Because I figured out a long time ago where your feet are, that's where you'll be. <laughs> Hopefully, anyway. Confirmation of this, as far as him remaining close alongside of us, is in Ephesians 1.13. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, watch this now, he identified you as his own. How? By giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. You are bought with a price. The shed blood of the Lamb. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. What a price to pay. How much would you pay to redeem Sheila Opper? See, Sheila, you don't have to do anything. You're just always on my radar. For, for those who don't know, she was our, my secretary for 23 years. We had 23 years of bliss. Yep. <laughs> We're in the house of God. Watch what you say. Number seven, the precise moment we believed in and confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, believing that he died and was resurrected, we were given the Holy Spirit to live in us. The very moment. He is the earnest. He's the down payment. Praise God. Romans 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by His life. So as I've said, we started out John 14.16. We've read it like a hundred times in the last month or so. When Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as our comforter or our pay... pay, (laughs) Yeah, uh uh-huh. Parakletos. He was literally referring to our entering into a relationship with him so that we could enjoy his abiding in us every single minute of every single day. We got to get that in our head. The Spirit of God lives and abides in me every second, every moment. He's in there. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Number eight, just think. The third person of the Godhead has chosen to live in us. Out of all the places he could live, he chose to live in you. Ain't that something? Therefore, because of our relationship with him, we never have to beg, borrow, or steal to entice him to come near because he's always alongside of us. What's the word say? I will not relax my hold on you. I will not relax my hold on you. 
I will not relax my hold on you. I will never, never, never leave you or forsake you. Oh, yeah, but you've been really bad. Mm, okay, well, he says he's never going to leave us. Never going to leave us. It's like some of our kids. You think they're never going to leave home. <laughs> We've learned, number one, that the Holy Spirit has been called to remain close to us. Number nine... The second thing we've learned, the Holy Spirit has a much larger calling than simply abiding in us, which we will discover in the next few weeks. And uh, I've shared my testimony that I was saved, I was born again in the Free Methodist Church when I was 12 years old. And contrary to common belief, you know, it's, it's like Pastor Cruzan, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an opinion. A man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an opinion. When I got born again, 12 years old, a lot of people want to argue with me. It's too late to argue. I was there. I heard an audible voice behind me when there was no one behind me. And he said, I want you to preach my word. A holy calling. Just like millions of people have been given a specific mission and a calling by God. And you know what? If you haven't asked God what your specific calling is, ask Him. What is it that you'll have me to do? 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to be something that you absolutely enjoy. So the Holy Spirit was specifically calliode, called, to para, come alongside us, and He's there 24-7. Para calio means... The Holy Spirit remains in us when we're having a good day, a miserable day, when we go to bed, when we get up, when we go to work, when we pray, when we don't pray, when we walk in the Spirit, when we walk in the flesh. He's there to convict and convince and persuade us to get into righteousness. Did you catch that? Yep. Y'all still awake? Yep. You're going to get out here early today, so hallelujah. So the list goes on and on and on. He even assists us on the job. I mean, he's not going to pick up a hammer and drive a nail for you, but he's going to tell you where that nail belongs and how to drive it straight and not bend it and finish, tear up the finish on the trim you're putting on. Yeah. Right, Alan? He won't let you be an idiot, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> the list goes on. He even, he even remains in us when we fake being sick. Uh-huh. Oh, I don't... I don't... I don't think I should go to church today. Well, you got to. You're the pastor. Shut up. So years ago, I've shared this before, and I got to. Some of you haven't heard this. When uh, when our son was probably in first, Jim was in first or second grade. He we woke him up, get him ready to go, get on the bus, go to school, and he was just. Oh, I'm just. I'm so sick. I'm just. I'm just so sad. I just don't feel good. I just really. I really have a hard time. And he, he, he was the kind that that everybody in the house would have the flu. Go through that. You know, you go through that. You give it to the next one. Give it to the next one. He was the kind that no matter what it was, no matter how it happened, he always got it worse than anybody else. Yeah, but you had the flu, but I really had the flu. So he got up. Oh, I'm just feeling, was it okay? So you can stay home today. You don't have to go to school. Oh, great, great, great. So he played with his Hot Wheels and he watched cartoons and he did this and had a big old fun time. So the next morning he got, we woke him up and he's laying, he goes, I really don't feel good today. And I goes, what, you want to stay home? Yeah, I think I should. Okay, you can stay home today. But there's going to be no TV, there's going to be no toys. You're not going to be able, because if you're sick, you need to recover. You can't recover doing all these other things, so you need to just relax and get in there and go back to bed. Okay. Went back to bed. Deb and I on the front room talking. Five minutes later, he come in. Hey, it's a miracle. I've been healed. I've been healed. I said, that's great. That's great. Now, go get dressed because I'm going to take you to school. The Holy Spirit is even in you. Even when you fake being sick and you don't want to go to church, you don't want to go to Aunt Martha's house, whatever it is, he's always in there. He's always, in there. He's always on the job. <laughs> always alongside you. Everywhere you go, he goes. And you know what? I heard a while back that he especially loves going to Farm and Fleet. So I, 
I do the best I can to accommodate him as many times throughout the week. So, Number 10 on your outline, the Holy Spirit has a specific job assignment to help us in every area of our lives. And he can help us in the following ways. He can give us spiritual, motivational, and ministry gifts. He is seen through the fruit of the Spirit in us. He will convict or convince us of sin and our shortcomings. He reminds us of the scriptures and the sayings of Jesus. He gives us power to be witnesses. He's, perhaps some of these things really don't excite you, but remember, He'll never, 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 never force you to do something you don't want to do. He's a gentleman as well as an expert encourager. Let me give you just a few verses. Psalm 28, verse 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in Him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song will I praise Him. The Lord is their strength, and He is the saving strength of His anointed. He is our helper in a very present time of need. Psalmist said in Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. In fact, Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before you. How many of you know Pastor Mark Utek? Mark Utek, he was preaching one time, I, I think it was here, and he pulled out a lead of head, a head of lettuce. <laughs> Flipped this lettuce up, and he caught it, and he flipped it up, and he caught it, and I thought, what in the world? And he used it out here. Let us strip off every weight. Let us run with endurance. <laughs> the truth of it is, I'm convinced that we cannot do these things in our own strength. Aren't you tired of trying? Yes. You just walk in the Spirit. Regardless of how many New Year's resolutions we make, we can't even decide to walk right without His help. Because as soon as you decide you're going to walk right, guess what? Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Psalm 3, 4 said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and He heard me out of His holy hill. Selah. Pause and think about that. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, and the Lord sustained me. So it's really important that we get this next truth in our heart. The Holy Spirit always ministers to us according to God's will and many times not according to our own desires or demands. Can we hear that? A great example we see in Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. He's always praying for us to receive God's will. So don't you see it? We don't know how we should pray. How do we pray about a specific need? Well, the key is found in these last 12 words. The Spirit pleads for us in harmony with God's own will. He only does what the Father tells him to do. Just like Jesus said in John 12, 49, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life, so I say whatever the Father tells me to say. See, we can, we can have full confidence that the Holy Spirit will be alongside of us to help us according to God's will. Give me another three minutes, we'll get you out of here. Number 11, many times we fail to recognize the Holy Spirit's activity in our affairs, but he never fails to accomplish God's will. Once again, I think we've come to this specific point. Number 12, we'll wrap this up. Regardless of things we've done that we're not proud of, or where we've gone where we shouldn't have, or unfruitful words we've spoken, or incorrect judgments we've made, or sins of omission, commission, and mental attitude, sins we've committed, the Holy Spirit is always our comforter, always our helper, and with Him living in us, we can only succeed in our faith walk. We need to learn to rely on the Holy Spirit in us. We need to learn to call on Him no matter what we're doing. I love when Alan shares on our Wednesday uh, leftover meetings. Many times he says, I had this job to do. I had no idea how I'm going to get it done. And I asked God, Lord, show me. Show me how I can do this. Years ago, uh, you know, I've shared about 
the one buddy of mine that we were going to go in business together and buy his grandpa's moving business. He had a, a, a permit to, to move people in the state of Illinois. And uh, Grandpa Mordu, he used to talk about these places would call him with a 5,000 pound safe. They want you to move this safe from this door to the next store. And he said, I would have no idea how I'm going to go about it. No idea. He'd go to bed at night, he'd pray, ask the Holy Spirit, show me. Show me what's the best way to do this. And he said, every time, he never, it never failed. He never had a problem. He never broke anything. He never lost anything. Seeking the Holy Spirit's guidance. It's what we need. So stand up with me, if you will, please. Before we do this, is there anybody here that would say, I just want to ask Jesus into my heart today? Or I've taken the wrong turn. I got off the right path. I'm on the wrong path. And I want to come back into fellowship with him today. I'm not going to have you hide your eyes and close your eyes and hide under the pew. And Anybody here that would say, I need to come back to the Lord. So confess this with me. Will you, Holy Spirit, today I choose to partner with you. And I thank you for partnering with me. Part of your job description includes your coming along believers. And I thank you that you are in me. And you have been ever since I've been born again. Today I open up myself to you and embrace you as my comforter, my counselor, my intercessor, my advocate, and my helper. I thank you for never relaxing your hold and never loosing your grip on me. Help me to bring my Father God all glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. We'll turn this thing off. Who wants to pray us out of here? Somebody want to pray?